welcome to Night Clerk Radio, episode 56, where we are enjoying a century of Mawsoft this week. Mm-hmm. I-, I was alerted on Twitter to the existence of an album by uh, Echo Fukai, who produced a, a Mawsoft album that is 100 tracks, five and a half hours of glorious, glorious. <laughs> we'll talk about this in more detail, but not just Mawsoft. It's a lot of genre variety. Mm -hmm. on this album, but I sort of wanted to give a caveat because due to our kind of accelerated recording schedule this month, because of my aforementioned travel, which I guess, fun fact, Ross, while this is coming out, I'm probably sitting in your living room, blasted out of my mind, (laughs) watching (laughs) some stupid shit on your TV. (laughs) I've got some great stupid shit for us to watch. Yeah, It's the best. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) Well, joy of asynchronous communication there. Mm-hmm. Thank you, podcast. <laughs> but uh, so more importantly, why that matters this episode is that a week of listening is not really enough time to do an album like this justice. Mm-hmm. We've done other long albums like Master Boot Record. We did uh, uh, Four Next Voids. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the Master Boot Record episode. Sorry. But yeah, Four Next Void is the artist. And yeah. we did their very long album. Mm hmm. We talked about the caretaker. I mean, we, we specifically talked yeah. about one of the albums because they break up the, the collection into multiple albums, but yeah. Right. Yeah. But in all those instances, yeah, we're either doing a subset, like in the case of, uh, in the case of the caretaker and like for next void, we probably had like a month of listening time for that. Mm-hmm. But for this one, we had about a week. So I, I had like a kind of a secondary topic associated with the album so that we're not like unfair to the music. Mm-hmm. Which is more like the idea of engaging with big media, with something like this, with large projects. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which I I know I mentioned to you in passing. I have a a few kind of notes, but like when you have to deal with something in these these unique circumstances, like what is your approach? How do you engage with it? Mm -hmm. Because I basically listened to the whole thing, I think two and a half times, roughly, before we ran out of time about that's actually about where I got to. And, and one of those was in its entirety, like a couple of days ago, just while I was working. I just had to. Oh, all day. yeah. I didn't. I, I had to break it up uh, mine into because I was editing podcasts. Mm-hmm. And uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. So I couldn't listen to it while I'm editing podcasts, weirdly enough. Uh, and that's one of the things about like, yes, it's long, but you sort of indirectly end up having to break it up. Mm-hmm. And, and like, does that affect how you listen to it? Does that does it feel different? than other big art projects you might consume. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was, I was just saying there's always this interesting like um disconnection between like death of the author, authorial intent, blah 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 is you know that's a big subject, but like the aside from what the author intends, there's also the the way the author intended the audience to consume the media. And that, like that's you know, and this this applies against all the media, and it, it's kind of like it's everything from big time movie directors be like, ah, my film shall only be appreciated in the theater, uh, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> and uh, how dare you watch my film on a phone, you know? Yep. Yeah, and and the what the audience actually winds up doing, and does that change the meaning? I mean, I, I think it does to a degree, but mm-hmm. it's sort of inevitable. Uh, I mean, we're not for a large part, like consuming Shakespeare the same way Shakespeare intended it. But for uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as an example, from one thing, we let everybody on stage now, not just dudes. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, like, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's that's a, that's a very interesting question for this album. I, I mean, I, I would have some thoughts about this album in particular, but like, I think it varies a lot. And like, I think in general, just being able to consume the media at all is better than not being able to consume it. Um, I think, yeah. you know, purity of intent, you know, you could only do this. You must take uh, exactly three hits from a blunt and go to a <laughs> darkened bedroom and listen with quality headphones with your eyes closed. That is the only way you can listen to this music like that. That kind of For sure. purity is a little grating because if your work can't stand reality in terms of how the consumer, the, the, the audience gets it, then it's not really if your message was so delicate. That it, it, it can only it can only be fully understood <laughs> in that context, and like maybe you need to work on your presentation skills. But on the other hand, like you know, there is you can get better meaning, like better quality audio. Like it sounds better, you can get more depth by hearing the subtleties of sound than rather than blasting it on a cheap stereo. Mm. 
you know, uh, yeah, it's it's complicated. But, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point I had not considered. Yeah, and I think for me, for music, it's the way it affected me was kind of interesting because I typically listen to music in whole albums. Like, I don't like to do singles mm-hmm. very much. I, I like whole album experiences. Mm-hmm. But typically albums are not this long. And that's just a personal preference on albums, not like, oh, if you listen to singles, you're not really listening to the music, man. Yeah. See, I like mixes, which are like, I know. I guess, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It's, yeah, it's interesting. But the, the way that comes in here is that I'm used to breaking up my listening experience just because an album ends and I have to put on a new one. Mm-hmm. So with this one, when I was listening to it in one shot, when I was working, I was like, is this still going on? And I knew it was in the back of my head. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I, I like intellectually knew but it like it hadn't ended. It hadn't been like 45 minutes or an hour and I didn't have to go to the YouTube or Bandcamp or Spotify and, and pick something new. And that like really messed with my perception of listening to it. Not in a, mm. not in a good or bad way, but just having one thing on for that long. Yeah. And just having like the same album on to my ears. And in some sense, it kind of works because when we talk about the album specifically, because I do want to go over some of the music in it, even though you can't cover all of it in depth. Yeah. It is varied. And so it, yeah, it kind of tricks your brain into like, it's very clearly one idea, one album, but it has like lots of little sub parts to it. And yeah. that, that sort of messed with me in this long album when we're used to breaking stuff up, but I wasn't breaking it up. I don't know. It's just a unique listening experience. It, it was because this album has a lot of surprises in there throughout the entire album. Like I, a lot of times I've actually listened to some of these longer like this is not entirely unknown to vaporwave, like uh, especially in the ambient hypnagogic side, like telepath is pretty notorious for releasing very long uh, album uh, compilations. And mm-hmm. the thing is what I have noticed my, my, my stereotype of these kind of albums is that they, they'll have some slick stuff towards the beginning, but they kind of settle into like a structure. And then it's like, you get, you get, there's very, it's not, it's not a loop, but like, you're not going to get any surprises two hours into a four hour album. Yeah. And this one okay. definitely does have some surprises even towards the end. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then as, as far as big media, which I, he kind of already covered on, I was trying to relate what it's like listening to really long albums to other mediums. Cause for example, we, I think both of us don't mind long movies. Like I make a joke about mm-hmm. like every Marvel movie is too long or like, oh, it's got to be a tight 90 or else I ain't renting that VHS. Mm-hmm. But we also love longer films, I, th- I think. I, I like, maybe I'm speaking for you. No, no, I do like longer films if they're good. <laughs> yeah, like long, like long art film, right? yeah, yeah, like, yeah. which is different because that's not really a big deal. to. I don't know. It never really feels like a big deal to sit down and watch. Um, I don't know what's a long film like uh, it's a cliche answer, but like Seven Samurai or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Seven Samurai. Yeah. There, yeah, there, there are a lot of really great films that are longer and need that extra time to kind of build up. Uh, yeah, a lot of Kurosawa's works are are like that, but mm. there's just a lot of, especially recently. Uh, oh, like Blade Runner twenty forty nine is a very yeah, it's almost three hours. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I would consider that a long movie, and it kind of needs all of that time uh, to get going. But yeah, there's just a lot of bloat now, and I think a lot of Hollywood films are. Just well, that's that's what we we gotta cram in all the special effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah. S- side point to that, the bloat. But the other thing I've really noticed in the past ten years is having like a twenty minute sequence or side side sequence or introduction or something for every character, just in case the audience is like, "I like that character." Mm-hmm. And then they're like, "Well, spin off time, baby!" <laughs> like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now here's your TV show or whatever. Well, like, I mean, kind of related is especially in the the Marvel and other cin- uh, attempted cinematic universes mm-hmm. is, yeah, they they they, they already know they're going to do a side a spinoff or a sequel or something like that. And they just like, OK, here's 20 minutes of the movie to set up a different movies that you will yeah. go see, because now you know that this this character Gleebor is going to go off and have their own adventure. So it's like, hello, Glebor, tell us about your problems. Oh, wow, that sounds cool. Well, we'll see you in Glebor's Adventures coming next summer. All right, back Disney to our Plus. shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like a fucking uh, even, not just Marvel, but like DC with like the Suicide Squad. Oh, well, mm. the John Cena character, guess what? He's going to have his own TV show. And that's going to be pretty cool, huh? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. 
It's way off topic from this album, mm-hmm. but I was just thinking about all the different ways in which I, I think, I think probably like for me, the thing that the longer works, I think the biggest category that would be novels, right? Cause like that's sort of like the thing is to write the, the great American novel or, or, you know, and it's this big fucking doorstop of a book. It's like <laughs> 500 pages or more. And like, it takes a while to get through that kind of book mm-hmm. for me, at least I am not the kind of person who can, at least now uh, I cannot just sit and read for three hours straight. Yeah. Even if I had the time, like I, I, uh, I just cannot focus on a single thing for that long without being distracted by something else. So it's, um, it's definitely hard. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that. Cause I was thinking about books, but I didn't want to bring it up. Cause I thought our pre album discussion was, was a little long, but that's fine. Yeah. Cause yeah. books are the other one where I think books are my favorite of the big mediums. Mm-hmm. I don't know, just like the information content of like a big, dumb maximalist novel, like really appeals to me. Oh, sure. Sure. Like, like 700 or a thousand page nonsense that just touches on mm-hmm. every bit of human knowledge or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those are great. It's just, it's hard. Like I'm that, that's yeah. going to take me like six months to read. Like, yeah. 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 I read like a 500 page book recently. <laughs> I finished one recently. It took me like four months to get through, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, but anyway, yeah, we should probably talk about the actual album. <laughs> On our music podcast? Yeah, weird. That was track two, aisle two, looking at the windows, landscape, uh, the landscape is in Japanese, from Endless Mall, Deep Dreams by Echo Deep Dreams. Uh, Deep Dreams is in Japanese. Again, a lot of the, as many <laughs> Vaporwave albums, part mm. of the text is in Japanese, part of it is in English. And uh, yes, this is a hundred track Molsoft album. It is a compilation of Echo Deep Dreams all of their mall soft work up to that point uh, it was released January 17th, 2021. And I wanted to sample this track uh, in particular because I was playing it and Maddie heard it and said, Oh, this is like, this is like the credit scene for the end of your <laughs> life. This is what you hear when you die. Uh, I was like, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, yeah that's pretty, pretty good, pretty good catch, which is very thematic. Cause Maddie had not read the subtext of mm. the, track titles tell a story so the liner notes of this album explain one day i dreamed that she was there walking alone through that infinite shopping mall was she my beloved i'll never know until i reach the end the end of this endless mall so every track title is part of a story about someone who wanders through this infinite mall finds this woman in and falls in love with her they fall in love with each other uh, and then towards the end, starting with track 53, certain tracks are bolded in italicized cursive text. I don't even know you could do that with track titles. <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah. I love you. And let's see. What is it? I I love you and I don't make you suffer. And <laughs> like, OK. And so like and that's the lady is deaf and she that is when she's bolded italicized cursive text that is her speaking but we'll live our love forever here on track 99. So I just love that whole part of it because like is it is it a whole metaphor about capitalism consumerism is that we 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 love it and it kills us is it just trying to be symbolic? I don't know. Is it just <laughs> a dude trying to be very aesthetic with this? I don't know. But I, I really dig that approach to uh, layering subtext within or literally text. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those reasons that I think the album deserves more attention ultimately than we're going to give it today. Mm-hmm. And I actually had a thought of like, 
wouldn't it be kind of fun to do not this type of conversational podcast where it, it's kind of hard to go into every track in detail because mm-hmm. you're kind of talking to each other and instead do some big, long, like video essay. Mm, yeah. It's like an intro to the album and the genre. And then I don't know, like five parts, one for each 20 tracks and then some kind of outro, like do like a seven part, big, long, dumb video essay. Yeah. Not dumb, but uh, really, really just dig into it. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I'll ever do that. This is not a promise that that'll happen, Yeah, but it's, it's it, it like inspired that thought of like, mm-hmm. oh, I bet there's actually a lot going on here. We could dig into mm-hmm. samples used. Could be something to cover in like in a live stream we do for our patrons or something like that. And that uh, could be fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Cause that's how I listen to it. So the, the subtext is interesting and it, it and Maddie is, call about like what you hear when you die is sort of interesting because that's almost the opposite of how i think about the album which oh. ends with dying mm-hmm. right not starts with yeah but maybe like so maybe they die and end up in the mall yeah you just you're in the, <laughs> the life flashes before your eyes it's just a mall yeah because this album kind of maps on the different aisles of a mall to the different stages of life in a way i think mm-hmm. so uh which is a real interesting way of looking at it i'm never gonna look at them all the same way it's like <laughs> you really could live forever in a mall yeah because there's there's tracks that are like walking slower walking even slower now mm-hmm. like those those types of names like growing old mm-hmm. <laughs> just kind of interesting and then the last i don't know 15 tracks or so clearly about like one of them dying mm-hmm. i guess yeah Give the titles and the, the content so yeah, so it's just this long, long relationship. Mm-hmm. Living an eternal love. That's uh, right. Yeah. L- like this if you cry ever, Tim. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, the music itself is interesting too, because man, you love Mallsoft. I like Mallsoft, but you you love yeah. Mallsoft. I, I love all that hypnagogic, underphonics, sleepy. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. And boy, we got we got a lot in this album, but uh, so much of it. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, now one thing I, I do, the the tags on this album on Bandcamp, the artist apparently is uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I saw in your notes that you made a note of the Bossa Nova well, stuff. So, yeah, the Dream Sky it's released on is in Sao Paulo, right? Uh, okay. I don't know if the artist specifically is. Oh, uh, OK. Because they've released other stuff on other labels that are not Brazilian. Um, OK. But I know where you're going with this. I'm sorry to cut you off. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Just uh, I'm not 100 percent sure where the artist is from. I I could be wrong though, so sorry if I. No, no, yeah, yeah, I didn't know either. That their their social media is pretty vague about these things. Okay. So I just wondered if there was a connection there between that. I thought about it too because, like you're going to say, this there's a lot of tracks that have what sounds to me to be like Brazilian lounge music. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was gonna when I brought this up, I was gonna say. Same as you that the the labels list is from Brazil. So I don't know if I was like aware of that and kind of filling in the gaps <laughs> mm-hmm. on my own of saying like, oh, this sounds like Brazilian, but maybe it's not. Mm-hmm. But it does sound like some like Bossa Nova style rhythms. And a lot of the singing uh, is a little too distorted in some cases for me to hear it very well. But it does sound kind of like Portuguese. Yeah. Which would make sense in Brazil. So I, I don't know. I think it's interesting though. That was like one of the, the main groups that I, I noted in tracks mm-hmm. in this one. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, I mean, yeah, like you said, there, there are different like groupings of, of track types, like the classic kind of mall soft stuff, like the, the first sample we did and then the bossa Nova stuff. Well, do you want to put in a sample here? Sure. So that was a sample from Isle 18, Discovering a World. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the Japanese translated offhand. 
And this is just an example of this gentle guitar shakers, like auxiliary type percussion mm-hmm. and a woman singing mm-hmm. and it sounds to me like it's in Portuguese. So there's like definitely kind of this lounge music connection mm-hmm. that we've talked about before in, in other episodes. But like you said, there's, there's groups to these tracks. Mm-hmm. So it's too many tracks to talk about each yeah. one in detail. So I, I have them in like three groups in my mind that kind of like formed as I listened to it the two and a half times. So one was the lounge music, which I thought was really interesting and really interesting breaks in the album uh, against everything else, but still kind of given the same treatment as other music. Mm-hmm. The second group, I, I noted a few tracks, probably not all of them, but are ones that have extremely recognizable samples in them. Like things I just knew without even thinking about it. So like track 10 has, if you don't know me by now, which is like a classic R and B ballad. Track 52 has, uh, yeah, how, tell me how am I supposed to live without you? Yeah. <laughs> like over and over again. And then the one that we both <laughs> latched in on was track 39, which has this looping in it. So that loop is from the Jolly Roger Bay song on the Mario 64 soundtrack, mm-hmm. which has been sampled a billion times. In, yeah. Yeah. But it's so recognizable. And mm-hmm. it was probably the one that stood out to me the most because I sort of expect like pop and R&B samples mm-hmm. in this. But I did not expect video game samples. I probably should have. But it definitely was like as soon as I, I heard that melody, I was like, oh, wait, I know that. Yeah, no, I, I, um, <laughs> it's very appropriate for this, this kind of album. Yeah. Maddie recognized it exactly. Like what, this is for Mario 64 years. What levels that? Oh, that's mm-hmm. the underground level. That's, you know, Charlie Roger. Bay. Yeah. 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 But the, it, it's interesting because it's a, a, just a loop of that track and not the full thing. Mm-hmm. And it's so like, there are some tracks on this album that are very signal wave. Like they're very much like taking this one, one mm-hmm. loop and just kind of playing it to lull you into this, like, I don't know hypnotic suggestible state almost <laughs> like it's it's really interesting that, that there's this varied approach to it's not like there's it's it's a Molsoft album but there's a lot of like tracks that would fall more easily mm-hmm. to different genres of vaporwave yeah and what i think is interesting about the heavy sample tracks like the ones we've mentioned is that they're loops but they also tend to be longer mm-hmm. like one thing I didn't really mention is that while it's a hundred tracks, it's not like a hundred two minute tracks, Mm -mm. right? Like some of these are 12, six, seven, 10 minutes. Um, So for example, track 39, aisle 39, which we just sampled, that's called I kneel. That's 12 minutes. So it's like this sample for 12 minutes. So there's like these certain points in the album where you feel like you're like in a rut. I don't Mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Not in a bad way, but like you're sort of locked down in this moment and it doesn't really move on. And then other parts you move through very quickly. Mm-hmm. Or, or like very intensely. So that, that sort of pacing is also phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, like that one in particular, it's, it's like one, when I started playing, it's like, wait, is, is something wrong with my music? Play, like uh, music playing software. <laughs> it's like, Oh wait, no. All right. It's, it's just doing that. Okay. Mm-hmm. We also have a lot of peak mall soft techniques because it's not just the, the plunder phonics mm. made to sound like it's in a, in a, an actual mall. We also have a lot of field recording stuff. Yep. I do appreciate like in track 71, we have like babies crying in the distance over crowd sounds uh, Mm -hmm. over the music. And uh, although it does get weird, track 81 just has some weird screaming in it, (laughs) Mm -hmm. followed by this kind of weird Vangelis chill ambient kind of music for a bit. Yeah. And the the track before it, track 80, is just like nature field recordings. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. How can I forget the field record? Yeah. The nature. Yeah. 
what is that track even called? Does it have? So track 80 is explosion of memories. Yeah. Which is just like running water mm-hmm. and a little bit of music, but there's like nature field recordings. And then track 81 you're talking about is uh, each aisle of moment, each aisle of memory, each aisle of feeling. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And then as we get towards the end of the album, we start, I seen like kind of, I, I would just describe it as like slush wave, kind of like pitch down distorted, mm-hmm. um, like track 91, but you made me understand love. And I <laughs> fell in love with you, dear. And th- these tracks are all examples of what, to me ended up being like the third group mm-hmm. of songs, which is a bit of a catch all, but they're like parts that are significantly different than what they're what's around them. Mm-hmm. Like that they, they really stand out. So some other ones were like track eight has like really, like really dreamy synth kind of out of nowhere, mm-hmm. like very different and chill and down tempo compared to, to the tracks kind of around it. Another one is this little bit from track 12. That's aisle 12. Everything seems so fast and it's a short track appropriately as per the title, but also it just stood out to me because it's so glitchy and spacey. It has like all kinds of like tape distortion and effects on it. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. And it just, it just really aesthetically stood out at that point in the album to me. And there's a track 23. I'm not going to play samples, all these, but like track 23 is called an intense night. Which I sort of joke that they always do like, you know, the song's playing in another room. Well, this song's playing in another building. Like it is so <laughs> buried in effects <laughs> that it just sounds so distant. And like, I think it's like on purpose, like you're maybe in this room together and like everything else just seems so far away because you're so focused on who you're with. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Track 44 gets a red flag ding for having messenger notification oh, sounds God, in yeah, it this album trolls you like i <laughs> several times like the first couple of times it happens like i checked whatsapp and then like ah <laughs> oh, god and then i like eventually i got used to it but i was like man i i wonder i i mean it's got to be intentional it can't be just like the dude was recording and uh the, their whatsapp just kept dinging while they were recording <laughs> <laughs> like but oh uh, oh uh, god <laughs> <sighs> yeah that one took a it was like uh, let's see the field recordings like already mentioned mm-hmm. and then there's another repeated sample at the start of track 86 which is um casual and fun moments mm-hmm. but it appears in several other tracks i should have gone back and written down all the numbers my mm-hmm. apologies but it sounds like somebody it's like right at the very beginning and it sounds like it's somebody saying it's a sun in like this booming echoey voice <laughs> it's a sun <laughs> Yeah, it's a son. I was like, oh, what is happening? Are they having kids or like, don't worry. Are about you it. the son yeah. are you being born into a mall? I don't know. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's like, there's a lot of depth to this album, uh, mm-hmm. especially for a mall soft album. And it's, it's cl- like, it's clearly not just like I did a hundred mall soft tracks. Let me just throw yeah. them together. Like there's a lot of thought into the structure of it. And the meaning of it and like, again, the song titles, each track title being like a part of a story. Like, I don't know. It's, there's a lot to, yeah, to ponder here. It, it does deserve an in-depth analysis, I think at some point. Yeah, I agree. I think that was sort of my, my final point also is like that it's hard to argue against like the sheer variety and ambition of this album, mm-hmm. I think is how I phrased it kind of in my mind is like, even if you're not normally into mall soft, I think you have to give it a listen. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's pretty compelling. And there's little like 30 second blurbs of, of tracks and stuff are really kind of only scratching the surface. I think of, 
what you can unpack from this album. Yeah. If you really wanted to, to get into it. Yeah. The, the full length is five and over like five hours, 33 minutes uh, and some change. So like, yeah, there's, there's a lot to dig into, but yeah, if, if you're working and you can just listen to mall soft all day uninterrupted, then yeah, here you go. <laughs> yeah. Best job. Yeah. Name your own price on Bandcamp. Uh, <laughs> so what, what could go wrong? G- give them a couple bucks. That's right. Yeah. Support artists. Yeah. It's a good value for your money for sure. <laughs> 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 yeah i think i want to leave it at that i don't know do you have any final thoughts i i, I think that's about as cursory an introduction to this album yeah as as we can give without turning this into a, a, a much longer episode yeah if you're listening to this episode i'd be really curious uh let us know what you think the 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 if there is a metaphor or a subtext to this uh of this love story like that's that's the most intriguing mm-hmm. element to it as well of uh death is mall the mall is death but you love her anyway uh or love transcends consumerism perhaps uh or heaven is an endless mall i don't know there's a there's a lot open to interpretation so i i'd be curious for everyone listening uh on your podcasting app or youtube wherever you are let us know because i i'm genuinely curious yeah i i am as well so i'm gonna leave you with sample of my favorite track track 90 called what So thanks so much for listening. I am really glad that we had this opportunity to inspect a, a hundred track mall soft album. And thank you to Ross for actually doing it. <laughs> As Ross said, just to reiterate, let us know your thoughts on the album. Love to hear from you next episode. We're going to be getting into summertime. So I, I want to do a, a rethinking the summer jam episode where we try to come up with like summary albums that are not your standard synth wave outrun future funk type fair. So yeah. excited to see what we come up to talk about for mm-hmm. that. Definitely. If you want to support the show, we have a Patreon at night clerk radio at patreon.com. Right now it has uh, something like 14 bonus episodes and a discord full of cool people who love to talk about listening yep. to and making music. A uh, big shout out to all our new patrons uh, who have just joined in the last couple of months, a uh, month or two. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for supporting us. And, uh, we're, we're uh, some of you sharing your own music and uh, uh, links to the cool vaporwave stuff. So thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. You can also find us uh, most anywhere. Easiest is Twitter where we're at night clerk radio. I am at Burke McBurkinson. Ross is at Ross Payton. Ross and night clerk radio at websites, Facebook, Instagram, etc. cetera. Uh, wherever you do choose to check out night clerk radio, if it has a way to interact with it, to rate review, like dislike, Go ahead and hit it because it really helps us out. And if you also really want to go above and beyond, just tell somebody about the show. You know, try to spread the word. Word of mouth is probably still the most powerful way to get other people uh, Mm -hmm. knowledgeable about your interests. So definitely talk to people about the show and Vaporwave. And until next time, bye. Bye. (laughs) 